In this video, we will cover adjusting view settings and applying and assigning view templates. In this floor plan view, you can see several different colors, along with varying line weights and different brightness levels. We'll take a look at how this is controlled. When nothing is selected, the Properties palette will display the parameters of the view, or the view settings. Several of these settings can also be controlled in the view control bar. For example, you can see the scale and the detail level in the Properties palette, as well as in the view control bar. The detail level is important to duct and piping components. At the fine level of detail, both ductwork and piping appear as double line. At the medium level of detail, piping appears single line and ductwork is double line. And at the coarse detail level, both ductwork and piping appear as single line. I'll switch back to the fine level of detail and we'll take a look at some more view settings. You can access the visibility graphic overrides from the properties palette and we'll discuss that in depth here in a minute. As I keep going down the list, I'll get to the discipline parameter which is important and you'll see that it is grayed out along with some of these other parameters. If you see a parameter in the properties palette that's grayed out or one of the view settings in the view control bar, that, will, that should tell you that there is a view template that is driving those parameters. And when you scroll down, there's a view template parameter here uh, under identity data. And you can see that the mechanical plan view template has been assigned. And I'll click that button. It'll open up the assign view template dialog. And once again, you can see that mechanical plan is selected. So what that means is that the mechanical plan view template is assigned to this view. So any parameters that are included in this view template will drive or control those view parameters. So in this case, when I take a look at the discipline parameter, you can see that it is included with the view template and the view template's assigned, so it's driving that view parameter. If the view template was set to none, then, that per then there's not a view template assigned. So a quick note here on the discipline parameter. If one of the MEP disciplines is used, then architectural elements will be half tone. And so that's why you see a different brightness level for the architectural components. It's because they are half tone. I'll click OK to close this dialog. And then while we're discussing view templates here, so once again, if you see a view template filled in in this view template uh, parameter, that means it's assigned. You can also use view templates by applying them. And so if I switch to the view ribbon and on the graphics panel, expand view templates, you can see that there's also a tool here called apply template properties to current view. That is a one-time application of those parameters. And so once you do that, you can then adjust any of those settings. So if we were to apply the mechanical plan view template, we could then go in the properties palette and adjust the discipline parameter and any of these other ones that are grayed out. So that is the difference between applying and assigning view templates. Now, another a view setting I want to point out while we're here in the properties palette is the view range. So when I scroll down under extents you can see view range and I'll click edit and I'll click show and this will provide a little picture here that will show you what these settings do. So the view range is extremely important especially with MEP design and for example if you're doing underground piping you want to make sure that you adjust the bottom or the view depth to include the piping that's below ground. The, if you want to see things above the ceiling, you want to make sure that the top is adjusted accordingly. And then the cut plane, that will, that's 
that's big for how the architectural components are going to show such as the doors that that are cut by the viewer or if it's above the door then the then the op door opening won't show and so on and so forth so the view range is extremely important I'll click OK to close the dialog and then let's wrap up by discussing visibility and graphic overrides so when I click edit next to visibility graphic overrides it's going to open up the visibility graphic overrides dialog and you should know that this dialog only controls settings for the current view and so you can see that right here it says for floor plan and lists out the specific floor plan view first off you can control the visibility of categories and so on the model categories tab I can control which model categories are visible and as I scroll through the list here you can see for example duct uh, I can turn off ducts uh, duct placeholders duct fittings duct accessories if I did not want to see those in the view and so that's a if you want to show a duct plan versus a pipe plan you have a high level control in the category there are also other things you can control you can control the line styles that are being used here so you can override that and control line graphics uh, for projection lines and cut lines you can also set certain categories to be half tone and you can also override the detail level and so that's for example if you wanted to set the detail level to coarse and then have your ductwork and piping appear fine you can do that by using the controls here in the visibility graphic overrides dialog there are also uh, annotation category and annotation categories tab so you can control things like text and tags analytical model categories applies mainly to structural components and then if you have anything imported you can control imported categories and then on the filters tab you can control uh, you can set up filters and then control those and we have a couple here so uh, first off I'm gonna close this dialog and you can see that our supply ductwork is blue return is magenta and exhaust is green and that is being controlled by the duct systems and specifically the duct system type but here you can see that some of these air terminals have been overridden they don't match the system color and so that is controlled in the visibility graphic overrides dialog now anything that's specified on the model categories tab will be overridden by the system type and then anything on the filters tab will override the system types so for example our supply uh, ceiling HVAC supply filter has the cyan color and it is being control it is controlling the air terminals so if I come into the filters dialog you can see that it is overriding or it's applying to air terminals and specifically supply air terminals and then it's being overridden with a cyan color and then similarly uh, you can see some other filters here that are being used and so there are when you use filters they can be used to control visibility as well as graphic settings and then you can control whether or not to enable that filter and then once again yeah whether it's visible and then some of the graphic settings there lastly on the Revit links tab you can control whether the any of your linked Revit models are visible and then you can control specific uh, display settings for the link and so an example here is if you had plumbing fixtures in the architectural model and you didn't want to see them if you turned off the model category entirely then it would can it would turn off your plumbing fixtures as well as those in the architectural model or any other link for that matter if you wanted to turn them off just for the link you could set it to custom and then go to the model categories tab and change the model categories to custom and then you could make that change in the on the model categories tab and turn off plumbing fixtures and so that's how that's how you can set up your graphic display and visibility of objects in your views in this video
We will cover using section boxes and scope boxes, applying color schemes, and creating plan regions. Let's begin by looking at section boxes. Section boxes are available in 3D views. I'll open the 3D mechanical view and then in the properties palette scroll down to the extent section and you can see the section box parameter. I'll enable section box and when I do nothing really happens at least that we can see and the reason is because the visibility of section boxes are turned off and this is pretty common in some project templates especially out of the box templates. So I'll type VV to open up the visibility graphic overrides dialog, switch to the annotation categories tab, and then scroll down and you can see that section boxes is turned off. So I'll turn the visibility for that category on and click OK and then you can see the section box. When I select it you can see controls on each edge and those can be used to control that edge. And when I move an edge into the model you can see that it clips the model. And so section boxes are a great way to take a look inside your model. Once again section boxes are only available for 3D views. And there is another way that you can control the extents of a section box and that is with the selection box tool. And let's take a look at that. When I hover over this fan coil unit and press tab to select the attached ductwork and then select it, on the contextual ribbon in the view panel there is a selection box tool. And when I click selection box it will adjust the extents of the section box so that it surrounds the elements that I had selected. And so you can see the other components that may be in that area. And so I can see here that I have a clash. And so I, I really like to use the selection box tool during coordination. And so when you're in a 3D view and you use selection box, it will adjust the extents of the section box in that view. If you are in a floor plan view, and you use the selection box tool, it will open the default 3D view and then adjust the section box in that view. And so in, in this default 3D view, the, there are architectural components turned on, and so you can see the walls and ceiling and so on and so forth. And so that's using the section box tool and then using the selection, sorry, using the section box and then using the selection box tool to control it. Next we'll take a look at scope boxes. And So on the view ribbon in the create panel there's a scope box tool. And so their scope boxes have a few different uses. And so I think most people use scope boxes when they have a large building that won't fit on a sheet at the desired scale and so they will use scope boxes to indicate certain areas. That's especially in MEP that's used quite a bit. They can also be used to control datum elements and we'll take a look at we'll take a look at both of those. So if I select if I click scope box to activate the tool I can then simply click two points to place the opposite corners of a rectangle. And I've created a scope box. I'll name this one Area A, and then we'll create another one, and we'll call it Area B, just for sake of example here, and we'll create another one, and we'll call it Area C. Now if I go to a 3D view and I disable section box so that it turns it off, I can now see those scope boxes. And so you, when I select it and, and orbit around you can see controls on each edge similar to a section box. 
And so you may be thinking, well, what's, what's the difference, right? Well, first off, they are not clipping any parts of the model. And, and you can see them, and they're not, in this view, they really don't appear to be doing anything. But there are several things they can do. And so if I go back to the floor plan view, I'm going to duplicate this view. I'll duplicate it as a dependent. And now I have a dependent view, and I'm going to rename it. And for sake of example, I'll just rename it Area A. And if I scroll down in the Properties palette here, you can see there's a scope box parameter. And I can assign Area A to this view. And what it's going to do is it's then going that scope box is then going to control the crop region. And so as you can see, that's a quick way to create views for smaller areas that are still associated to the larger floor plan view. And so I can now place this view on a sheet and it'll fit at the desired scale. The other thing you can do is control datum elements. And so if I select a level, and this could be used for grids or reference planes as well, you can see there's a scope box parameter. And once again, I can associate it to one of the scope boxes. And so in this case, I have scope boxes for areas, but if you wanted to control levels and grids, you may want to create an overall scope box that you can use to control those, to control your datum elements. Last thing on scope boxes here, when I select it, you can see that there's a views visible parameter. And when I click edit, you can see that I can then control where these scope boxes will be visible and not only that, but associated datums for uh, the, the associated datums to these scope boxes. And so if you want to control those for different 3D views or elevation views or plan views, you can do that here in the scope box views visible dialog. All right, I'll close the dialog and then switch back to the floor plan view and we'll take a look at color schemes now. On the Analyze ribbon, in the Color Fill panel, you can see several Color, uh, color Fill Legend options. The first one just being Color Fill Legend. And so when I click that, I can then place a legend in the view, and then a dialog will open up where I can choose what I want to apply it to, and then the actual color scheme. I'm going to click Cancel for now, and I will open up the Ground Floor HVAC Zones view, which has a color scheme applied for uh, zones. And when I scroll down, I can see there's a color scheme parameter for the view. And when I open up the Edit Color Scheme dialog, you can take a look at what the, the scheme is doing. And so in this case, we have it applied to HVAC zones, and the color is simply based on the name. But there are several things you can do if you wanted to apply a a color scheme based off of area or even based off of load or airflow, you could do that as well. Okay, last view feature we will cover is plan regions. If you have a certain portion of the building model that needs to have a different view range, then you can use a plan region. And if you switch to the view ribbon, and then in the Create panel, if you expand Plan Views and then select Plan Region, you can use the tools in the Draw Gallery to sketch your plan region. For example, in this lobby, we may want to have a little bit higher view range. And I'll finish it. And then when I have it selected, there's a View Range parameter in the Properties palette. And then I can adjust the view range for that plan region separate from the plan region of the floor plan view. In this video, we will cover creating schedules and filtering, sorting, and grouping schedule information. Schedules are a great way to report the information in your building model. To create a schedule, scroll down to the Schedules Quantities branch in the Project Browser, right-click, and select New Schedule Quantities. This opens the New Schedule dialog and you can select the category of elements that you want to create a schedule for. If you want to include multiple categories of elements, 
you can select multi-category. For this example, I'll select Air Terminals. When I do, you can see that the name fills in automatically, but you can customize this as needed. Next, you can choose to schedule building components or schedule keys. Schedule keys is what you would use if you were creating a space schedule that was going to con contain a lot of information and that information could be customized by something like a space type. For this example, we're going to schedule building components and that's probably what you'll use most of the time. And then uh, lastly, we can choose the phase. So if we were working with a phased project, we could schedule existing air terminals or if there were multiple phases in this project, we could choose to create a schedule for uh, one of those other phases. But in this case, we're going to select New Construction and then click OK. This opens the Schedule Properties dialog, and the first thing you should do is add fields to the list of scheduled fields. And these are the parameters that will be added to the schedule. At the top, you can select available fields from air terminals and if you expand this you can also choose room space or project information if you wanted to add parameters from one of those with air terminal selected you can see air terminal parameters in the list of available fields and you can select one and then click add parameters for example I will select type mark and then click add parameters you can also double click a field such as family and type and it will be added to the list of scheduled fields. We can also add flow and then we will add manufacturer and model. A quick note here, if you see multiple or duplicate values in this list of available fields, that is likely from shared parameters and there can be multiple shared parameters that are added with the same name because Revit is looking at the shared parameter GUID and so if you had air terminals from different sources that had different shared parameters uh, with the same name then you may see duplicate parameters here. A couple more items to note on this tab of the schedule properties dialog is you can add a calculated parameter and if you click that you can then uh, customize some type of calculated value to add to the schedule. You can also combine parameters and let's say you wanted to add the min, maybe you added the min flow and the max flow, you could combine those into a single field using the combined parameters. If you had multiple models and they were linked together you could include element you could select include elements and links if you wanted to add those air terminals to the same schedule and so if you want to you can schedule elements from linked files that's this option right here I'll click OK and we'll go ahead and create the schedule and when I do you can see that every air terminal in the project is listed in the schedule and so that may or may not be what you want to do in this case it's not we do not want to schedule every single air terminal and so what we will need to do is either adjust the filtering or the sorting and we'll take a look at that so in the properties palette next to sorting grouping I'll click edit and this will open the sorting grouping tab of the schedule properties dialog and an important option to pay attention to is itemize every instance so with this option selected it's going to include every single item of that category. If I deselect it, what appears will then be based on what I choose to sort by. So in this case, if we choose to sort by family and type and then click OK, our schedule is then sorted by family and type. You could add additional levels of sorting. So in, in the, on the sorting grouping tab of the schedule properties dialog, there are three other then by options. If you wanted to also sort by, say you had a manufacturer listed, you could do that uh, or, or any other parameter for that matter. Now, you'll notice that we do not have a type mark specified and schedules are not 
just a great way of reporting information, but you can also input information into a schedule as well. So for example, let's say our supply diffusers, we'll start with a 24 by 24 face 6 inch neck, and we will have this be A. So if I type A and press enter, it says that this, this change will be applied to all elements of this type. So this is actually a type mark is a type parameter, so it'll apply to all those. And then we'll just continue adding a few options here for the type mark. And as you can see, that is filling in. Now, if I were to go to those air terminals and look at the type properties, you would see this value. Next, let's look at filtering. So I have some type mark values now, so I could actually filter based off of that. So let's say I just wanted to include the supply diffusers. There's a, since I cannot filter based off a of family and type, I could filter off of the type mark, and I could choose that type mark that has a value. So in this case, it's just my supply diffusers, and so I could, that's one way that I could go about it. But there are multiple ways to filter schedules. So as you can see here, I can filter off of most of the parameters that I have added. So I could filter off of flow equals a certain value if I wanted to do that. Or flow is greater than and then choose a specific value. And so you can, depending on the needs of your project, you can get creative with your filters. Okay, let's say that I wanted to center the type mark values and center the flow values. You can do that in the, on the formatting tab. So on the formatting tab, if I select type mark, I can control the heading orientation and then I can also control the horizontal alignment. So if I select center, then the type mark values will be centered. I'll click OK and we can take a look at that. So there's a lot of flexibility here to get these things to look like you want them to. You can also add some conditional formatting. So if you wanted to do a conditional formatting based off of the flow, uh, you could do something like that. Lastly, on the Appearance tab, you can control the graphics, such as the, the line styles that you use for your grid lines, or even the outline, and then you can, you can also stripe rows if you, if you wish to do that. And then text, you can control whether or not to show the title or the headers, and then control those, the, the fonts as well. So as you can see, lots of ways to customize your schedules so that you can report the information in your building model. In this video, we will cover creating sheets with the correct title block, creating revisions, and adding revision information to sheets. In this project, we will create a sheet for the ground floor HVAC plan view. To create a sheet, scroll down in the project browser to the Sheets branch, and then right-click and select New Sheet. This opens the New Sheet dialog. You can select the title block you want to use. In this case, we'll select the E1 30 by 42 title block, and then click OK. This immediately creates the new sheet, and Revit automatically names and numbers the sheet. You can expand the Sheets branch in the Project Browser and then right-click a sheet and select Rename. For this example, I'll enter M101 for the number and then for the sheet name I'll enter Ground Floor HVAC and click OK. Take note that these are parameters in the Title Block family and you can update them in the drawing area as well by selecting the title block and then activating one of the parameters. To place the view onto the sheet, you can drag and drop it from the project browser. So for this example, I'll select the ground floor HVAC plan view and drag and drop it onto the sheet. When I do, you can see the viewport underneath the cursor. And I can simply click to place the viewport on the sheet. When you place a viewport, be aware that there are two things. There's the viewport, and then there is the viewport title. If you select the viewport, 
you can then use your cursor to drag it and move it anywhere on the sheet. Also, there are dot controls on the view title tag that you can use to adjust the length of this line. If you want to move the view title, you have to deselect the viewport and then select the view title, and then you can move it independently of the viewport. When you select the viewport, you can click Edit Type and view the type properties. You can create multiple types of viewports. For example, you can see that the parameters here are Title, Show Title, Show Extension Line, and then Line Weight, Color, and Line Pattern. So you may, at a minimum, want to have a viewport that shows the title and then another one that does not for maybe details or legends or uh, other types of non floor plan and section views. I'll click OK to close this type properties dialog and then we will take a look at the revision schedule. And so in a title block family you can add a revision schedule and have it populate with revision information. Now to add revisions to a project or sheet issue information you can switch to the View Ribbon, and then in the Sheet Composition panel, click Revisions. And this will open the Sheet Issues Revisions dialog. This is where you can add sheet issue and revision information. To begin, there is a, there is a revision added by default, and you can, you can adjust the revision number. Now you cannot do so manually here, but you can s click one of the numbering options, either numeric or alphanumeric, and adjust how the, the sequence numbers. So for example, for numeric, you can adjust the starting number, and then you can even add a prefix or a suffix. And then alphanumeric, you can enter in characters for the sequence. And then once again, add a prefix and a suffix. I'll click OK to close this dialog and then next you can control the the numbering method so either numeric, alphanumeric or none if you don't want any numbering and then depending on which one you select it'll use either one of these options that have been specified. Then you can enter a date, enter the revision description and then after the revision has been issued you can select the issue checkbox but notice that when you do this information will become grayed out and cannot be modified. I'll deselect issued and then you can also enter issue 2 and issued by and then under show you can choose whether you want to show the cloud and the tag, just the tag or neither one of those. To add revisions you can click the add button and it'll add new revisions and then you can also control the numbering method in this dialog. The options are per project or per sheet. If you select per project, then the revisions will be numbered in based on the revision number in this dialog. If it's per sheet, then they will be numbered based on the revisions that are placed on the sheet and not necessarily based on the total number of revisions in the project. Uh, when you switch the numbering method, a dialog will appear. It's asking if you want to do that, I'm going to click no and we'll leave it set to per project. You can also move revisions, you can move them up or down. And then if you want to remove a revision, you can either merge it. So if, if I'll, I'll select a revision so you can merge it with the revision above or below it. And then there's also a delete button and you can just delete it all together. But a couple things to note here, if a revision has been issued, if, so if I click issued and then I select one of those, you'll notice that I cannot delete it and I cannot merge it with the revision above or below. But I can select multiple revisions and then delete them if needed. So I'm going to leave these two and I'm going to deselect issued and then I'll click OK. And then in the project browser, scroll down and you can see a revisions on sheet parameter. And I will click edit. 
and this opens the revisions on sheet dialog. And here you can choose whether or not to show each of these revisions on the title block. And so if you add a if you add a revision tag that it appears on the sheet, then that information will be added and then you can use this dialog to add additional revisions to the title block. So if I select both of these, if I select that they are shown and click OK, then they will appear in the title block even though there's not a cloud associated to that revision placed on this sheet. In this video, we will cover creating views of various types and adjusting view properties. When you are modeling or documenting a building project, there are several types of views you can create to help you. When you switch to the View ribbon, you can see several tools on the Create ribbon. There are tools to create 3D views, section views, callouts, multiple types of plan views, elevation views, drafting views, and several more. We'll take a look at some of these tools. For example, when you click Section, you can then click two points in the drawing area to place the section head and then the section tail. Then you can adjust the far clip plane of the section. With the section selected, you can right-click and select Go to View to open that view. Next, I'll expand the Callout Split button and you can see that you can create a rectangular callout or you can sketch a callout. I'll click Rectangle and then I can click two points to create the opposite corners of a rectangle for the rectangular callout. And then when you are working with sections and callouts, you can double click anything that's blue, which in this case are the, the head, the callout head and the section head, and it will open that view. When inside one of these views, there are several of the same view controls, such as scale and detail level, and so on and so forth. You can also use the, the crop region tools, and you can even use temporary hide isolate, and reveal hidden elements or temporary view properties as needed. Continuing on, you can create multiple types of plan views, such as floor plan views and reflected ceiling plan views. Take note that floor plan views are looking from the top down, so you can see the floor, whereas reflected ceiling plan views are looking from the floor up, so that you can see the ceiling grid. In some cases, on the MEP side, you may need to use a plan region if you need to have an area with a different view range. You can also create elevation views and then drafting views. When you click drafting view, it'll open the new drafting view dialog and you can enter a name for the drafting view and then set a scale. I'll leave it at the default values and then click OK. And the point here that I want to touch on with drafting views is that drafting views are independent of the building model. So, in other words, you cannot create model elements. So when I switch to the systems ribbon, you can see that none of the model element tools are available. And so they are used to, you can add in basically anything from the annotate ribbon. You can add detail lines, uh, filled regions, you can add detail components, text, and things of that sort to create some type of detail in a drafting view. When you're creating these, you look for the question marks in the project browser so that you can see where these drafting views and section views are coming in. And depending on how your project browser is sorted, uh, you may need to change certain parameters to get them to adjust accordingly in your sorting method. I'll switch back to the plan view and you can also create legends and so legends are a great way to if you have several symbols such as on you know on the mechanical side supply return exhaust you can place detail components and text in a legend view in order to create a legend that you can place on a sheet. Now, 
there are ways to duplicate views as well. As you can see, this the duplicate view tool here. You can duplicate views. You can duplicate with detailing, which will duplicate the view and add any view-specific elements as well, such as tags. And then you can duplicate views as dependent views. And so this is great if you have multiple areas in a floor plan view so that they can all fit on a sheet at a certain scale. You can duplicate those views as dependent views, and then they will all have the same view parameters. You can also right-click a view and access those duplicate options as well. So if I right-click a view and select duplicate as a dependent, then you will see that view is now a, an, a branch that can be expanded in the project browser, and you can see any dependent views. And then if you change any of the view parameters, in the view, whether it be the dependent view or the parent view, then that will update for the other ones as well. Now, these views also have type parameters. So if I click Edit Type for this floor plan view, you can see that you can adjust the callout tag and the reference label, as well as the view template that's applied to new views. And so I can, when I create a new floor plan view, it is going to use this template. Now, the, the next option controls whether or not that template is assigned to the view or whether it's simply applied, a one-time application, and then you can adjust the view parameters. So in this case, since this is selected, it is assigning that view template. So I'll click OK, and then scroll down in the Properties palette, and you can see that a view template is assigned. One thing to note, if, if you do have a view template assigned and you still want to adjust those parameters just to take a look at something, maybe you want to turn the visibility of certain categories on, you can always enable temporary view properties from the view control bar, and then you can adjust the, any of the view settings uh, re without affecting the view template. I will restore the view properties. Lastly, I'll switch back to the section view, and then we'll click Edit Type, and you can see that section views and callouts, they also have type properties. And so if you want to adjust the, the callout tag or even the section tag, you can do that uh, with the type properties as well. For example, if I click in the section tag field and click the More button, it'll open up the type properties dialog for the section tag, and you can adjust the section head and the section tail, and if you have those families loaded into the project, you will be able to select them in these drop-downs. So, just to summarize, several different types of views that you can create, and then you can also customize those views to help you model and document your building projects. In this video, we will cover adjusting the phase status of elements, and using phase filters. Phases allow Revit to be aware of time, and you can create multiple phases to represent different phases of construction. There are various workflows that can be used, but we'll discuss how the functionality works in Revit. To begin, scroll down in the Properties palette to the Phasing parameters. Views have a phase filter and a phase parameter. Next, select a duct. When you scroll down in the Properties palette to the phasing parameters, you can see a phase created and a phase demolished parameter. Model elements have these two parameters and the combination of options allow the element to either be existing, new, temporary, or demolished. We'll take a look at how this works. On the Manage ribbon, in the Phasing panel, click Phases. This opens the Phasing dialog. On the Project Phases tab, you can add additional phases. For this example, we'll keep it existing and new construction. On the Phase Filters tab, you can create phase filters for views. As you saw, views have a phase filter parameter, and these are the options that can be selected for that parameter. 
Pay attention to the column headings. New, existing, demolished, and temporary. Those are the four phase status conditions that model elements can be, depending on their phase created and phase demolished parameters. Any phase filter that has a phase status set to overridden will use the controls on the graphic overrides tab. I'll click OK to close this dialog and then we'll use the four runs of duct to model the four phase status conditions. I'll select the first run of duct and then take a look at the phasing parameters. In this case, the phase created is new construction and the phase demolished is none. That means that this run of ductwork is new. I'll select the next run and then we will change the phase created to existing and phase demolished to none. When I do, you can see that the color changes and the line work changes as well. This is due to the graphic overrides that are being used for existing elements. When an element is created in the existing phase and not demolished, then it will be existing in any future phase. I'll select another run of duct and then we will set the phase created to existing and the phase demolished to new construction. When I do that, we are going to get an error stating that the elements need to be disconnected. I'll click disconnect and then you can see that the elements are now dashed. So what's happening here is that we have an element that was created in the existing phase and then demolished in the new construction phase. And so that means that these elements are demolished in the new construction phase. And as you saw, the elements cannot remain connected. So when you're working with duct and pipe and they are demolished, then those elements cannot remain connected. I'll select the last run of ductwork and we'll set the phase created to new construction and then phase demolished to new construction. And once again, we get the error and I'll click disconnect. These elements are now temporary elements. And so when elements are created and demolished in the same phase, they are temporary elements. So as you can see here, we have existing, new, temporary and demolished elements and the combination of those two parameters phase created and phase demolished will determine the phase status condition. Now let's take a look at the view parameters. If I scroll down in the properties palette and I change the phase to existing then we're going to notice that there are a lot of changes and so the existing elements they are now blue again because they are they are new in the existing phase and the demolished elements they also appear here because they exist in the existing phase the only issue though is that they are not associated to a system and they're not connected I'll change the phase back to new construction and then we'll, let's take a look lastly here at the phase filter parameter. The phase filter that will control what actually appears based on the phase status. So right now I have show all which is showing all phase statuses. If I click show complete now only existing and new ductwork appears because I'm showing the completed status of, of the phase if you will. And there are several other phase filters that you can use. I'll switch back to show all and then let's open up the phasing dialog again. On the phase filters tab, once again, you can control the phase filters and for each phase status, there are three options by category, which will use your regular view controls 
overridden, which will use the controls on the graphic overrides tab, and not displayed, meaning that the, that phase status will not even show in the view. I'll click OK to close the dialog, and we'll take a look at one more thing. I'm going to enable select links, and then select pinned elements, and I'm going to select the linked model. And when I click edit type, you can see that there's a phase mapping parameter in the type properties dialog. Here you can map the phases to a linked model. So in this case we have an architectural model. It just has existing and new construction and this uh, the host model has existing and new construction. But if there were multiple phases you could then map to those phases. And so you may be just doing one specific portion of the design maybe just for one phase a build out and maybe you get an architectural model that has five or six different phases and all you need to do is model existing conditions and then new construction and then here's where you could map to those phases in the architectural model. In this video we will cover selecting the appropriate tag to place, tagging elements, and adjusting tag properties. In the ground floor HVAC plan view, you can see that several systems have been modeled. We can now tag various components. On the annotate ribbon, in the tag panel, you can see several tag tools. Tag by category will tag individual components, whereas tag all will tag all of the components you have selected or all the components of a specific category. There are also tools to place space tags and room tags. These are the tags that can be used on the MEP side. Let's begin with Tag by Category. When you activate the tool, there are several options on the Options bar. To begin, click Tags. In this dialog, you can see the tags that will be used for each category of elements. For example, for air terminals, the diffuser tag will be used. You can scroll through this list and make sure each category of elements that you are going to tag has an appropriate tag selected. If the tag you want to use is not available in the drop-down, you can click Load Family and then load the appropriate tag. I'll click OK to close this dialog. Next, in the Options bar, I'll deselect Leader. And as I move over various components, you can see different tags form in the model and they are hovered over the element that's being highlighted. You can simply click to place a tag. And in this case, we're not using a leader, so the tag is placed right on top of the component. You can continue clicking elements to place tags as needed. When you enable Leader, you can then choose whether or not the leader has an attached end or a free end. With attached end selected, you can click a component and a tag will be placed with a leader. When you click free end, you have to click where the end of the leader is going to be placed and then you can click where the leader elbow is going to be placed, and then lastly where the tag will be placed. I'll click Modify to end the command, and then the duct tag is still selected. When the free end is selected, there will be a dot control at the end of the leader, so you can adjust it as needed. When attached end is selected, there is no control at the end of the leader. You can just move where the tag is located, or you can control where the elbow is placed. With the tag selected, you can still change whether the leader has an attached end or a free end in the options bar, or you can control whether it has a leader at all. You can also click Edit Type, and this will open the Type Properties dialog. And the only parameter here is Leader Arrowhead. I can expand this drop-down and then select one of the leaders that are available. For example, I'll select one of the arrows and then I'll click OK. 
And note that this is going to update all tags of this type. I'll deselect the tag and then activate the Tag All tool. In this dialog, you can choose the category of elements that you want to tag and then you can also choose the tag that you want to use. For example, I'll select Space Tag and then if there were additional space tags, I could choose one from the Loaded Tags drop-down. I can also choose whether I want to use a leader and the leader length and the tag orientation. I'll deselect leader for this example and then I'll click OK. When I do, the space tags are placed in every space in this view. Additionally, you can select components first and then on the annotate ribbon in the tag panel click tag all. This time only selected objects in current view is selected so I can leave this selected or I could switch to all objects in current view. And then I can choose the category of elements I want to tag. So in this case I have several different categories of elements selected but I can still choose which categories I want to tag. With mechanical equipment tags selected, I'll click OK. And now you can see that mechanical equipment tags have been placed. I'll zoom in and select one of the duct tags. When you click Edit Family, the tag will open in the Family Editor. Be aware that tags are made up of labels. And when I select the label, I can click Edit Label, and then I can see the parameter that is being used for the tag. In this case, for the duct size tag, the size parameter is what's being used. So it's important that you understand which parameter is being used in the tag. If needed, you can add additional parameters to the tag. I'll click Cancel and then we can look at some of the other options. With Rotate with Component selected in the Properties palette, then the Duct Size tag will rotate with the duct. In other words, if the duct is horizontal, the tag will be horizontal. If the duct is vertical, the tag will be vertical. If you want to control this in the project, then you can deselect this option and then you can choose whether that tag will be horizontal or vertical. If you select the label, you can see that there are additional options in the Properties palette to control how the parameters wrap and then also the horizontal and vertical alignment. And then you can use Keep Readable so that the tag will always be readable. In other words, if it rotates around a 45 degree angle, then it'll flip so that it's always readable. And then you can control whether or not it is visible. So as you can see, there are several options that you can use to customize your tags so that they look just like you want them to in your project. In this video, we will cover placing keynotes, creating note blocks, and creating numbered lists. There are many different workflows for how keynotes and note blocks can be used. We'll take a look at how the functionality works in Revit. On the Annotate ribbon, in the Tag panel, I'll expand the Keynote Split button. You can place Element Keynotes, Material Keynotes, and User Keynotes. Element Keynotes will reference the Keynote parameter for elements. Material Keynotes will reference the Keynote parameter from Materials. And User Keynotes allow you to select a keynote from the Keynote table manually when placing user keynotes. I'll select Keynoting Settings. In this dialog, you can select the Keynote table. For this example, we'll use one of the default Revit Keynote tables from the Revit Family Library. But you can customize your Keynote tables with whatever notes you need for your project. You can also choose whether the numbering method is by keynote or by sheet. By sheet will number the keynotes based on the order that they are placed on the sheet. 
whereas by keynote will simply reference the keynotes. I'll click OK to close this dialog and then I'll select a fan coil unit and click Edit Type. This mechanical equipment has a keynote specified. And when I click the More button, it'll open the Keynotes dialog, and you can see where the keynote is coming from. I'll click OK to close each of the dialogs. Next, back on the Annotate ribbon, I'll activate the Element Keynote tool. You can place keynotes just like tags. I'll select the equipment, and then since I have a leader with a free end, I'll click to place the tag. Now once I place the keynote, you can see that it's referencing the keynote that was selected for the keynote parameter. I'll click modify to end the command and then deselect the keynote. Next, I'll place a user keynote. I'll select an air terminal and then place the tag. This time Revit opens up the Keynotes dialog and I can navigate through the Keynote table and select the Keynote I want to use. I'll click OK and then the Keynote is added. Once again I'll click Modify to end the command and then the Keynote is selected. Just like with tags, you can adjust the leader after it's placed. You can also adjust the key value after it's placed if needed. I'll deselect the keynote. After placing keynotes, you'll likely want to place or create a keynote legend and then place it onto Sheets. On the View ribbon, in the Create panel, expand the Legends button and select Keynote Legend. I'll use the default name and click OK, and then with key value and keynote text added to the list of scheduled fields, I'll click OK. Now you can see the Keynote Legend contains the key value and the keynote text for the keynotes that I placed. Once again, I'm using the default keynote table but you can customize your keynote table to meet the needs of your project. Back in the floor plan view, you can see that there are generic annotations that have been placed. You can create a note block based on a generic annotation. While this is very similar to keynotes, there are some different use cases for generic annotations and note blocks. In this case, I have a couple placed on air terminals and another one placed on the fan coil unit. Back on the View ribbon, in the Create panel, expand the Schedules button and select Note Block. When creating a note block, you can select a generic annotation family. In this case, mine is called Generic Annotation. I'll click OK. This generic annotation has a label parameter and a note parameter. I'll add both of those to the list of scheduled fields. You could also add the count and the type if, if needed. I'll click OK, and then you can see that this note block is very similar to the Keynote legend. Once again, note blocks are based off of generic annotations so you can customize them to meet the needs of your project. Note blocks are very similar to schedules in that you can adjust the sorting and grouping and filter them as needed. For example, I'll click Edit next to Sorting Grouping, and then I'm not going to itemize every instance, and I will sort by the label. Lastly, you can create numbered lists inside of text notes. This can be useful for creating general notes. In this project, I have a drafting view set up for the HVAC general notes. On the Annotate ribbon, in the Text panel, activate Text, and then click and drag to create a text box. I'll type General Notes and then press Enter, 
and type note 1, enter, note 2, enter, note 3, just so we can see how this works. I can click and drag to select the notes, and then in the paragraph panel, I can either create a bulleted list, a numbered list, or use letters to indicate my list. I'll create a numbered list. I can also click and drag to select general notes, and I can make that text bold and underlined. And now I'm well on my way to creating general notes that I can place on a sheet.